So, meine Damen und Herren. Okay, Ladies and Gentlemen. I also would like to welcome all of you. Welcome to the Heinrich Böll Foundation to this year's foreign policy meeting. It's wonderful to have so many of you here and welcome now after the lunch break. We had a very inspiring keynote presentation and panel discussion this morning. At the end of that, Frank Sauer seemed to be surprised about the form of discussion uh, at the Bell Foundation when we talk to the Green family on security and defense policy these days. And I'd like to say that the Greens already in 2007, that is to say 15 years before Russia attacked Ukraine, have taken stock of their first term in government and uh, they have developed a long-term foreign and security policy concept that then became the yardstick, the guideline for their further policy development. And this is uh, what was very important for the overall discussion about security and foreign policy affairs in the expert community in Germany. Unfortunately, we couldn't bring in the responsibility to protect concept at that time. At, unfortunately, we could not. Uh, in all parts of society, make sure that we need a strong defense of the rule-based international order. Today, I will be responsible for welcoming you and welcoming Annalena Baerbock, our Minister of Foreign Affairs. She was one of the very important contributors to the Green international um, security, foreign policy, and European policy concept. Annalena, when you gave uh, the uh, keynote speech on uh, foreign and security policy, the last one that took place before the pandemic set in, your message was clear. Of course, at that time, the situation was different. Uh, it was the end of the Trump presidency. We were looking for partners for the German European and security policy. And we had hoped that the EU would get much stronger in international security policy affairs. At that time, Annalena, when you spoke about international politics, you talked about the interests of our Eastern European partners. And here we said we need a strong security architecture of the EU. We need to be able to act. We need to take the geopolitical risks seriously, such as Nord Stream 2. But over and above, we as Greens were not always taken seriously enough. Today, there are people who say they want peace but they just want us to subject to the aggressor Putin, to succumb to the power of the strongest. And, uh, of course, that is uh, something we do not want to endorse. People who have such a perspective are still surrounding us, and we need to stand up against such positions and views. And that is why, dear Annalena, it is wonderful to have you as the German for Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, you insist that Germany takes more responsibility for Europe and the world. And we are very happy to have you here. And ladies and gentlemen, I hereby give the floor to our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Annalena Baerbock. Well, good morning. I hope that you all had a relaxing lunch break. Dear Emil Scholz, dear Jan Philipp Albrecht, dear colleagues from the German Bundestag, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, 45 seconds. 45 seconds to get your grandmother, your daughter, the little brother to safety. 45 seconds to take refuge under the kitchen table because the cellar is no longer accessible. 45 seconds, that's how long it takes for the Russian missiles to hit after the warning signal. 
in Kharkiv. How some of you might have noticed, I was in Kharkiv uh, in early January, and I saw myself what 45 seconds mean. Because I was told you can just sit in your car and count to 45, and then you know what uh, will happen. Luckily, nothing happened uh, with us um, where we were, but this um, does not apply to the people in Kharkiv. I've seen uh, apartment blocks crushed like cardboard boxes. I met a mayor in whose city more than 150,000 people have lost their homes, and I met school children in a warming center that uh, sought shelter there because the cold outside was unbearable. This is basically the everyday life in a city that's fighting a fight for its survival for months. One schoolgirl told me in this warming center that she used to play volleyball. She loved to play five aside with her friends, but with 45 seconds um, until the next bomb hit, uh, you cannot make it out of the um, place where you play volleyball um, or out of a school. So this is why these pupils are sitting at home. They do not play volleyball. They do not go to school. They go hardly out at all. They wait and they tend to count till 45 time and again. And these school children would like to go back to school, play volleyball again. And finally, hear that this war end. And this is what drives me every day. For the past year, Russia has killed people in Ukraine on a daily basis, and this war must never become normal for us. That's why we have to keep looking at what's happening in Ukraine, and that's why it's so important for me to be able to tell the people there that they will continue that we will continue to support them because this exactly is what the schoolgirl asked me. Can we rely on you? And honestly, when these questions uh, come up, I tend to hold my breath because a promise that you give and it says yes needs to be kept and we do not know whether this yes means a few weeks, a few months or a few years, but I said yes out of the full conviction of my heart because it's also our 45 seconds. And this is one of the great lessons of the past year. The trust of our partners in our country is maybe the most important currency of the German foreign policy. We Germans will never forget that we owe our life and peace and security and also freedom after reunification also to our friends in the world, onto which we were able to rely, even though the mood in their country sometimes changed. And this is why it is up to us today to reach out to them and say, we stand by your side. You can rely on us, even though debates become more fears. Because at a time when war is raging in Europe, this trust is our life insurance, our mutual life insurance. But this trust cannot be taken for granted. We have to work for it. And I know it's not particularly um, original to quote Heinrich Böll uh, at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, but I'll do it anyway, because he said many wise things that we should remember today in particular. And I'd like to quote, freedom is never given. It is only one. This sentence is more relevant today than ever, because Ukraine is not only depending, at, sorry, defending its uh, peace that children can go back to school, but also its freedom peace in freedom. And this is nothing that we should take for granted. This can be seen in the neighboring country in Belarus. These days, people do not have to count till 45, but many of them are not free, nevertheless. And this is why this sentence from Heinrich Böll is 
also a reply to all those who say, well, please um, stop fighting whether the whole of Ukraine is still Ukrainian or not. Um, well, it uh, doesn't matter. But this would also mean that the school girl in Kharkiv would have to continue to count till 45 because the missiles are coming from Russia and the border is only 40 kilometers away. And this is why air defense cannot have the effect it has in other parts of Ukraine. So this would also mean that children in eastern Ukraine, with whom you can only, uh, you cannot really uh, talk because they, uh, you cannot travel there and um, they are under Russian occupation, this would mean that they would not live in freedom. And this is why this call for a truce, even though it always sounds so easy, does not necessarily mean peace. And it's not a peace in freedom because a dictated truce under the current situations where part of Ukraine is occupied and we still see missiles and bombs that are being thrown. So this um, truce does not serve peace in Ukraine, but it serves submission, the submission of Ukraine, because the lack of war does not necessarily mean, or the absence of war does not necessarily mean peace and freedom. A dictated um, peace is not really a peace. A dictated peace does accept the right of the strongest, and it thus violates and ignores international law. So from my point of view, it has been so important that over the last year we discussed throughout the whole world and together what does peace mean for Ukraine. And many people I talked to said, well, this is your war, it's your peace. Where were you? Where was Europe when we needed you? And this is a justified question. This is a question that we have to ask ourselves again very critically. And But I said, well, you're right to pose this critical question, but who benefits if we repeat the mistakes of the past, if we look away when international law is being violated, because freedom is not being given. It always needs to be won time and again. And this is why it's so important that in this very threatening security environment, we do not only invest in our European security, but also in the trust of our friends and partners throughout the world. This applies above all to the support of people in Ukraine. So from day on of this war of aggression, we were by your side with humanitarian aid, financial aid and military aid. But not only we. So many different countries from the whole world, and some didn't mention it because they were afraid that they might suffer other repressions. So many countries throughout the whole world support Ukraine militarily, but in particular financially and in terms of humanitarian aid. And yes, it was right that we came to an agreement with our partners in January also to send battle tanks to Ukraine. Not only uh, or not because we think that tanks are great or harmless, but because we have to ask ourselves time and again, what if we do not take certain decisions? So we also have a responsibility for doing nothing or not doing things. And we decided that in this situation, as in the month before that, we would stand by the side of those who defend their freedom and who have the desire, similar to this school child, uh, to allow for people to go back to their normal lives, to go back to school, to play volleyball, because this is what international law demands from us. It is encoded in the Charter of the United Nations. And when the Security Council fails with its P5 members and cannot make sure that we have world peace, it is a matter of the General Assembly. And the General Assembly in March has, with an overarching majority, given an answer. We stand on the side of international law. When it comes to deciding between right and wrong, between an aggressor and the victims, we stand on the side of 
the law and on the side of the people. Because we do not accept that in Europe or other parts of the world, borders are being shifted based on violence and that millions of people are suffering. We do not accept that Vladimir Putin is enforcing onto us the logics of the past where the right of the stronger counts more than international law. And this is and this was the brutal lesson for many people, many countries in the world. It's not an abstract fear, in particular not for Moldova or Georgia. Uh, even in Armenia, we people see this as a real threat and also in other places of the world. People see that if we would accept that a stronger aggressor um, invades a weaker neighbor, no country in the world would be safe in the future. The countries in Russia's vicinity, therefore, listen quite closely when they hear a sentence from Vladimir Putin, like after the dismantling of the Soviet Union or the dismantling of the Soviet Union was the biggest catastrophe uh, of the 20th century. And a few years ago, some people said, well, he didn't mean it. But now we see in Ukraine that he did exactly mean what he said. So this is why this question or this issue of trust is not an abstract issue. We cannot simply say yes, uh, as I told you uh, earlier. Um, not only Ukraine, but also the other countries in Russia's vicinity um, demand it. And this trust needs to be there also in the future. And this is why we, together with our partners and friends in Europe, will now review our safety and uh, security and our defense. We massively invest in our security. And I think that we are not doing this based on some logics of the past century and say, well, these are our Western partners and friends. So for, from my point of view, it's not the West. Of course, everyone can define it in his or her own way. I'm 42. I did not grow up with this picture, East and West. Uh, so the large part, and we can be very grateful for that, the large part of my life was spent in a reunified Germany at the heart of a unified Europe. And so for me, this reviewing our structure does not only mean G7, NATO and EU alone, but the Russian president basically thought that uh, the EU would not be unified and also that the OSCE or the Council of Europe would actually be in disagreement because he thought there will be the EU countries on uh, the one side and uh, other states on the other side, but the contrary was true. And one of the most important sessions that uh, actually was not really present in the media last year was the meeting of the OSCE foreign ministers. And the fact that this meeting took place was actually a real sensation on the one hand, but during that meeting, we intensively debated the question, did we fail? or have we grown more closely together? And at the end of the two days, the result was that the OCE continued to exist, even though it does not even have a budget because Russia is blocking it, even though no money is being transferred or paid to the own staff. And others like Germany have stepped in that missions for other regions in the world are being started in order to become active when there are border disputes. This shows that even under the fiercest attack of international law, we can rely on our joint rules. The right, the law is stronger. We only have to defend it. We should not be, uh, we should not accept the strength of such a power. We will together fight for our security in Europe. And this is why uh, it is also my main task. And I mean, this is basically also an event at the Heinrich Böll Foundation for Diplomacy 2023 that we strengthen international cooperation, that we strengthen international law. And this is basically high on top of our agenda of international diplomacy. The countries 
that uh, are particularly closely linked to Russia need uh, this diplomacy. When I traveled to Kazakhstan last October, I talked to my counterpart in Astana to talk about a wind farm that a German-Swedish company wants to build there on an area, by the way, as large as Brandenburg. Such projects are important in a fight against the climate crisis, but they also allow right here and now, where we see the most important uh, crisis of our world, the climate crisis. Here, we can help Kazakhstan to diversify its economic contacts to create its own security using uh, wind parks. Kazakhstan shares the world's largest land border with Russia, a border of over 7,500 kilometers. Nearly half of all Kazakh ex imports come from Russia and Astana has always been one of Moscow's closest allies. But the war against Ukraine has also shaken this trust, these relations. When we condemned the Russian war of aggression in the United Nations, Kazakhstan did not side with Russia. When Russia declared the independence of the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, Astana did not take part in this farce. Because it's clear it's uh, a country that invades its neighbors, uses energy as a weapon. It has leading politicians that publicly question Kazakhstan independent statehood. Such a country is not a reliable, reliable partner for anyone. And not only Kazakhstan feels this, and that is why it is crucial right now that we explain to others outside Europe that they can rely, they can trust us to work with them. We do that, uh, oh, we try to find new partnerships, be it with Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan. We are with us when Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan and uh, Georgia and others want to have EU membership if they want to defend their infrastructure against hacker, hacker attacks. And those were also moments in the year of terror 2022 that we can use our links to get stronger together. Let's uh, take Bosnia-Herzegovina. Its candidate status three or five years ago, it would not have been possible to say that the EU would unanimously, unanimously uh, endorse that uh, status. And we are there when a conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia in Nagorno-Karabakh has been uh, waged for 30 years. We, as a community of peace in Europe, have decided we want to establish a new EU, EU mission there. And I am very happy that we are going to have a German mission leader. I know that uh, many people here in this uh, room have been active in that region. There were exchange programs for schools, there were fundraising programs and human rights actions. You all have done so much for civil societies in all these countries. And with those countries, we want to strengthen our cooperation exactly at that moment when we see the attacks. We want to do that because we have a stable framework for that. The offices of uh, the foundations, including the Heinrich Böll Foundation, have become a second home for many people in the region, a home of democracy and freedom where people can come and discuss and work and learn from each other and laugh with one another. Freedom is never given for free. It must always be won. This sentence is an incentive, a stimulus for many of the people in the region and for many people here in the room. And we know what this commitment is about. It's about millions of people in our immediate neighborhood. It's about bringing these people together. And this is my guideline for foreign policy. It's not just meeting ministers in the capitals. Our ultimate goal is bring people together so that they can talk to each other. 
And it's clear these states represent millions of people with different histories and traditions, different dreams and needs. It is this diversity that we want to focus on more strongly. When we say we defend our freedom, our peace, our common values, that doesn't mean we have to do things absolutely identically. It's all about also preserving diversity and in our diversity to stand up to defend our common values that share that are shared by all mankind, freedom and peace. And we are going to strengthen these formats of cooperation with civil society between uh, schools, universities, and also between the political foundations. I am also very pleased that this week we decided in the federal cabinet that Robin Wagner, and by the way, he sits in the first row, will in future coordinate the uh, cooperation with civil society, with the Republic of Moldova, the South Caucasus, and Central Asia. He will be the coordinator for the German government. Dear Robin, your work will exactly follow this approach. We hear you. You can count on us. And we will send this message together, especially to civil society in Belarus and Russia, precisely because it is currently not possible to travel to these countries. Many brave Russians who opposed this war, they're not gone. Some of them were just locked away, but they're still there. And they need the dialogue more than ever before. In Belarus, there are still over 1,500 political prisoners in custody because Lukashenko oppresses his own people. For these people, we are creating specially tailored channels of dialogues and projects that neither Putin nor Lukashenko can destroy. With Russian civil society, we as the federal government are launching a round table. It doesn't sound very inventive, but a round table uh, was uh, already successful in history. And at that round table, we want to gather democratic Russian forces in exile so that they can continue to be active for a free democratic Russia. Of course, in difference to what we used to have 30 years ago, we need a new form of round table. What is more important than ever before are visas, scholarships, and uh, digital networking opportunities. At the same time, we also want to talk about how we can continue to support civil society inside Russia. This year alone, we will implement over 50 projects with Russian NGOs and activists, not in spite of the war, but because of the war. Again, political foundations will play a major role there. Civil society in Belarus will receive our support in the form of our action plan. We promote independent media, offer protection programs for members of the opposition. And what is especially important, we are going to document human rights violations committed by the regime in order to be able to bring the culprits to justice. Because it is clear we are not going to forget the democratic forces in Belarus and Russia. We are not going to leave these people behind. There might also be children, not counting to 45 seconds, but they count every day until they can finally live in freedom again. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is in our very own interest to promote greater trust in Central Asia and South Caucasus. Because if our neighborhood is not safe, we will not be safe either. But also in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, we as networked economies have to rely on our partners. This became so evident during this last year of aggression and terror. On a global scale, we can only act together. And there we see that the perspective 
regarding Russia's war of aggression is a different one in many parts of the world. Let's have no doubts about that. So it is not enough to just travel there and say, please follow us, we'll tell you what to do. We know better. This will give us no success, and uh, obviously we would not say such a thing. What matters is, from my perspective, to be willing and ready to put yourself in the shoes of your counterpart. If you have a 70% military dependence on Russia, I cannot simply say, of course, I'm going to implement all Western sanctions. And I cannot do that when my immediate border is threatened by my own neighbor. And that is why it is so important for us to always be willing and ready to see the perspective of the other, understand it, but also not be silent whenever an argument is used that violates human rights. But luckily enough, many often it's the same questions that I get in other parts of the world that I get in Kharkiv. Can we rely on you? It was a question I was asked in Sharm el-Sheikh during the last conference of the parties when we wanted to set up a loss and damage fund for the climate crisis. And uh, we had said, okay, we have this proposal, people should be grateful. And we were surprised to meet resistance. And I remember one meeting when I thought, this can't be true. There are European countries saying, we need to reduce CO2 emissions much more. We have said, we want to set up a common joint fund. And one African country says, no, we reject all of that. And when we ask, well, we have no CO2 reduction and no financial funds. And they said, well, you have promised that too many times. And, of course, the reason was that other countries uh, exerted pressure. Their group of solidarity and confidence and trust is big, because in the old, older crisis, those countries were the ones uh, that have helped them. So if we want to strengthen our alliances, we always have to understand we will not be met with endless confidence and trust before proving it. So when it comes to peace in Europe, for me, it's so important to ask the question about climate protection, not because I'm a member of the Green Party, but I believe in that because uh, for many small countries, it is so decisive to know that their most important risk, the climate crisis, will be taken seriously. And we can only get the confidence of these countries if we do not just simply say yes, but if we do something, if we fulfill our commitment, if we finally set up the $100 billion fund and making sure that this climate crisis fund will be wisely spent. For us as Germans, that is crucial. Because if we want to overcome our dependencies, such as we uh, get rid of our Russian dependency, energy dependency, and others want to get away from the military dependencies in that region, then it is only possible to get all of that if we have financial security. One thing is the military aspect. And luckily enough, many countries do not see us Germans as a big military power. So when it comes to military power, they would look at others. But countries say, well, Germany is a country that is reliable. It's the fourth largest national economy. And of course, we have many economic capabilities. And so therefore, a sustainable economic policy and sustainable economic relations and ties are within our own security interests. They supplement our foreign cultural and development cooperation, the work of our political foundations. And therefore, when we talk about security, for instance, in our national security strategy, we should see that as an integrated security comprising all of these different aspects and areas, including humanitarian help. Not only in the light of this awful disaster in Turkey and northern Syria. And of course, since 
we are currently uh, negotiating our budget and we have a lot of financial constraints. Uh, people say, oh, you are the fourth largest uh, economic uh, partner, but we are the largest donor. Why don't we spend less money? My answer to that is trust is important. We are not a military superpower, but we are an important national economy. And trust and confidence is our most important currency. And if we want others to trust us, if we want them to support us when we want to secure our European peace order, they have to say, they have to understand that we support them in their own security concerns, be it the climate crisis or be it such a natural calamity as the earthquake. They must have the security that the international community will come in. If they see that Germany does not provide the assistance that it used to provide in earlier years, then there will be no conference. And that is why I say we need to do the opposite. We need to understand that even after, after this Titan vendor, this change of tides, the question of security has not become just a military question. Of course, we have to invest into our defense capabilities. We are vulnerable, and there is one central country in the world that does not implement international law and respect international law. But we need, at the same time, invest into international security, integrated security. And that takes more than a military budget. And that is why it is so important for us with our partners in Latin America, Africa, and Asia to develop meaningful offers that go beyond mere financial support in development cooperation, because those countries want, don't want to be just recipients. What they want is they want to, to invest together with us into their economies. And for that, we need fair offers. We need to have the confidence of our partners that we are not going to enter into short-term deals, but rather enter into short-term agreements, because trust is the life insurance for all these countries. If the sea levels rise, if the next drought is about to come, or if another natural calamity will happen, they need the trust. Trust in the world is essential. And that is why partners are essential in the world. And that is why we are so diverse, but we are united by one wish in order to be able to have confidence that people will help us when we are in need. We will be able to always uh, rely on this uh, trust. The trust of the people in Kharkiv means we have to continue supporting them. The trust of people in Warsaw and Vilnius means that we have to show we will stand up for their safety. The trust of people in Astana, New Delhi, and Accra means that we will have to make substantial and fair offers for our cooperation. This trust cannot be taken for granted. We have to invest into such a development of trust and confidence every day. Can we rely on you? If we invest on a day-by-day -day basis into our international alliance, then we will always be able in the future to say, yes, you can rely on us. Thank you very much, Annalena Baerbock. A minister has quite a tight agenda and many appointments, but your team said that uh, we can now ask one or the other question, and I think that we should not lose out on this opportunity. So two to three questions are allowed now. And I would like to ask you to raise your hand, and we'll start here with the uh, ambassador from the Republic of Moldova. Hello, uh, Madam Minister. I'm quite glad that you mentioned Moldova several times in your speech, so thank you very much uh, for that. 
and my government is quite grateful also for the relationship uh, that Germany has to Moldova and also the uh, efforts that have been made. Much has happened in 2022 already. Uh, Moldova, together with Ukraine, had the candidate status uh, for uh, the EU accession. Um, now we have to deliver, of course, but my question goes into a slightly different direction. I would like to uh, talk about foreign, uh, European foreign security and defense policy. So since the famous Putin speech at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, we could easily read where this change in the Russian or the Moscow rhetoric came from. <coughs> so after that, we had the uh, attack on Georgia and uh, Crim and Ukraine. And up until February uh, 24th, 2022, so where did the European security and defense policy fail or did it fail up until February the 24th, 2022? Well, obviously, the European foreign and security policy did not contribute to a prevention of this war. And I do share your view that there were some hints, and Jan Philipp Albrecht at the beginning has already um, touched upon that. Also, we in Germany, and we are a democracy with different opinions, luckily, and different parties. Um, and my party was also part of it. So certain um, things have been raised and mentioned time and again also by my party. But of course, it's of no use to look to the only to the past and say who was wrong or who is right. This will not bring about peace. So now we have to do two things. We have to make sure, and this is the German Zeitenwende, um, we are self-critical as Germans. We did neglect certain warning signals. However, your country and other countries did utter warnings, and we ignored that. For example, when you think of Nord Stream 2, we have a special responsibility right now to act. And this is what we did and do with the Zeitenwende, not only in the military realm, I would like to uh, say this and emphasize that, especially financially, especially when it comes to humanitarian aid. So um, we cannot simply say, OK, now we will accept a dictated peace, because this would mean accepting that hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people in eastern Ukraine would continue to live in unfreedom. And there are so many uh, children that were abducted, basically, and we do not know where these children are. And this is the lesson from the past. Yes, we made mistakes in the past. Um, and now, with regard to the support of Ukraine, we have to do everything so that you can, can live in a freedom again and peace again. And your country needs support as well. This is why it's so important and was very important also for me to go to the Republic of Moldova and to launch this support platform right after the uh, war of aggression started. And of course, the destabilization uh, takes place uh, in all areas. And this is the second part, which I didn't mention in my speech because I wanted to focus on the situation here in Europe, uh, the lessons that we have to learn for other regions in the world. This is why we also are uh, working on a China strategy so that we will not repeat the mistakes of the past, in particular when it comes to dependencies that make us blind for certain developments. Another question in the fourth row, the lady in the fourth row. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, Foreign Minister. My name is Foregonetska. For uh, as we know, the Russian war in Ukraine has been raging for nine years, and only now has it reached German perception. And thank you very much, also for everything that you do to help Ukraine. But I have a huge plea, basically, and then this brings me to my question. So a lot is happening. Germany is doing a lot when it comes to weapons deliveries and also other areas. Of course, we would like to see quicker deliveries, but a lot is happening also when it comes to humanitarian aid. Um, however, what does not reach civil society is a clear communication. Also, why it's so important to support uh, Ukraine and that Ukraine is not 
only defending its own freedom, but also the freedom of the whole continent of Europe. And it would be my plea to the foreign ministry, but also to others to communicate more openly to the general public so that um, people uh, can realize that not only the people that are present here in this room, but in general, the population in Germany in general. And you talked about the round table that you have set up with the activists from Belarus and Russia. We would also like to have such a round table with civil society actors from Ukraine. And we would also offer our support um, in that. And today we heard from Mr. Rasmussen that we urgently need an international security strategy. And I was wondering, is there a concrete idea what an international security strategy means? Is there a clear definition and indicators uh, for that? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. In view of the uh, time, I would like to briefly talk about the first aspect. Um, this is the main part of my job. I have to make clear time and again that this is nothing that we should take for granted, that a country that's 10 a 10-hour drive from here away is in the middle of a war. This should not become a normality, and we should not um, go back to our normal agenda like business as usual. So it's very important that we time and again explain what is happening on the ground in Ukraine. And the second aspect that plays into it is, luckily, we can continue to have an exchange with the Ukrainian civil society, which to a large extent is still in Ukraine, um, because we can travel there. Um, I just make the distinction between Belarus um, and Russia, where we cannot always travel. So our work there looks different. But in particular, civil society in Ukraine and also the one million Ukrainians who have come to us, of course, we will have a close dialogue, and not only through Robin Wagner, but also the whole foreign ministry uh, in Germany will have a close exchange here. And with regard to the last part of your question that referred to the continued support in different areas. Of course, we will um, make sure of that and we will continue that together with our partners. So thank you very much. When I made the offer that some questions can be asked, many hands went up and I would like to apologize to all those that cannot um, be picked. I have seen someone here with the headphones here, you're Benjamin Tallis. I think uh, I'm following you on Twitter. I find you quite interesting. I would like to ask you to ask your question in German or in German or English, uh, whatever you prefer. We, indeed, I don't only exist on Twitter. <laughs> it's true. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation, and I'll, I'll use the opportunity to ask in English if, if you don't mind. Um, thank you, Minister Baerbock, for this speech. It was excellent to hear um, questions of trust being put front and center um, in your uh, vision uh, for integrated security that will come. And it's that I want to pick up on and ask a little more about. Um, we see beside you, uh, behind you the sign that says security in, in Eastern Europe and the Eastern Partnership. Now, the promises that were made to Central and East European countries have been broken too often by the EU, by Western European countries, and trust was very much felt to have been betrayed. Up until this year, our commitment to Ukraine remained half-hearted and at, rather at arm's length. Thankfully, we've seen a reawakening of the kind of approach that looked for opportunities rather than saw threats in these countries in our neighborhood. But I wonder how you would go about restoring trust with the, the neighbors, with neighbors in the Western Balkans as well, but also with the Central East European states. And fundamentally, because I think this is at the heart of the problem, restoring our trust in ourselves that actually our model is better and can win that systemic competition that will will lead us to be more trusted and act as a true soft power in the world. Thank you. And I'm trying to uh, also jump uh, between the different uh, dimensions uh, of the question. Um, first of all, and this is not because I don't want to face ourselves as a German society or German uh, politics uh, with uh, mistakes in the past, but because I believe that politics is for the future. We cannot change the past. We have to learn from the past, but we can only change the future. And this is why, for me, mentioning what we should learn from the past, but focusing 
on the future, also with regard uh, to trust. And I believe also we have to understand, because I think these were some of the mistakes in the past, that we think what worked 50 years ago also works now. That we see opportunities, especially with cooperation uh, in our direct neighborhood, uh, in Eastern Europe, but especially in Central Asia, where we have a total different window of opportunity when we look to younger and future generations. I always meet women and girls and students, but especially young people. I go so often into classrooms when I go abroad, not because what some uh, uh, journalists might think this is way more easy. No, the toughest questions are actually uh, there, but because the perspective is totally different. When I was a in a classroom, for example, in Kazakhstan, one of the girls, and you never know what you experience, yeah, I wondered, okay, is, are they divided from their homes or with regard to the Russian relation and so, and, and she was so worried. But I went to a, a, a Russian university here and I thought, well, prejudices, yeah, coming from abroad, okay, probably totally Russian influence at home. But her question was the opposite, that I have only the opportunity to go here to Russian-speaking uh, university because there are hardly any European one. But would you accept me in Germany with, with a German employer when I have been at a Russian-speaking university? So this is a total different mindset because normally if I would go to Kazakhstan then people would say okay go there because you can do some mining and you get some raw materials but the investments we have to do especially with regard to our uh, need uh, for also talented uh, young people is obviously not only investing into mines and uh, industry relationship but also in universities we have done so in the past as well but obviously our cultural program because we thought we bring the universities there and then we teach them a bit yeah, about our values. But also understanding this, not only as a value question, but a hardcore interest question, because obviously, if there are only 40 universities from Russia and only one halfly kind of European, this is not in our interest. Because also then employees, not only because of the fear from the girl, but otherwise will not come uh, to, to Germany. And, and changing this understanding is for me so crucial when I say we are investing also in our relationship with regard uh, to Central Asia, with regard to uh, the Western Balkans and this divide, what we hear also often in a German debate, here are the values and there are the interests. I think this is, frankly speaking, total crap <laughs> because defending our values, which are rule of law, freedom and democracy, is in our interest, also in our business interest, because unfair competition is like not good for any European uh, company. And this flows in our, into our strategy and then focusing more on these countries because, frankly speaking, in the past, we didn't have a big focus on that region, and I think we should look really in detail into it and be frank to ourselves. Because obviously, there will be also countries, situations where we have to say, okay, stop, this doesn't work. If we want to have fair partnership, this cannot be a biased partnership where we are setting up free trade agreements and then somebody else is also um, owning the whole railroad uh, system. Then we don't have a dependency directly, but an indirect type dependency. So I think um, also for me, this is one of the lessons. We also don't have to be naive that in some areas we won't be successful, obviously. And this is why we definitely have to focus on those we do not only share, again, not Western values, but the values of international law and the rule of law. And this is, for me, the most important point. Super. Vielen Dank, Annalena. Thank you very much. You deserved a round of applause. Uh, thanks for giving us your time. You gave us some homework to do. And so we will have a lot of food for thought. Uh, Federal Minister Annalena Baerbock, thanks for being with us today. Ja, das war als eine now we have received an overview on, of many challenges of German security and uh, international policy, and we have a lot of work to do now. I would like to have my panelists now, um, Jürgen Trittin, uh, Sofia Besch, Justina Godkowska, and Marima Moran. Oh. 
So. Before we start our discussion here on stage with our panelists and Mr. Tritin, I would like to invite our audience to be active as well. You may have noticed you've got some red and green cards on your chairs. So maybe I'm going to ask you some questions as well, and I will hand over that question then to our panelists. And at the same time, I know we also have our people sitting outside on the staircase. There are also people following us on the live stream, and maybe they've got questions as well. All of them, all of uh, our audience can use the hashtag uh, Outpour2023. There you'd find the Foreign Policy and Security Desk of the Bell Foundation, and there is a tool where you can ask questions and or answer questions. I will start with something that was raised by Annalida Bierbock when she talked about Central and Eastern Europe. She said we have to become better. We have to have a closer look. We have to be more trustworthy. My question to you is now the following one. We've had one year of a so-called traffic light government in Germany. What do you think is the the German government's attitude vis-a-vis -vis Central and Eastern Europe? Do you think we're doing better than the government we used to have earlier? If you think we are on a good track when it comes to our relations with Central and Eastern Europe, use the green card. But if you think there's still a lot of work to do, please raise the red cards. And you can also participate in our online voting tool. And what I see here in the room is quite a mixed picture. It's interesting, there are a few red clusters. But over and above, I would say there's more green than red. But it's not absolutely clear. So we have a mixed opinion. Uh, the attitude in the room is that we are doing fairly well when it comes to our relations with Central and Eastern Europe. Let me now ask uh, just Justina Gotkowska, the head of the Center for Eastern Studies in Warsaw. She always uh, follows the situation in Germany. And do you share this opinion as well, also in the light of Mrs. Baerbock's speech? Are we doing, are we on a good track when it comes to developing ties with Central and Eastern Europe, and where do you see room for maneuver? Thanks for this question. I will start my answer from the position of a strategic situation, from the perspective of Central and Eastern Europe, and here I mean the Baltic States, Poland, the Visegrad Straits, the war in Ukraine from their perspective is of existential importance. And it is decisive, also, this war for European safety and security. If Ukraine loses, we might be the next. Russia, in December 2022, has proposed to probable treaties uh, focusing on the spheres of influence in Europe. And this doesn't end with the former Soviet Union states. So from a Polish perspective, my perspective, I have the following question. How about German politics? Has the German strategy uh, changed vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, the Ukraine, and security policy in the framework of NATO? My answer to these questions, I will give them right now. From my Polish perspective, it's a regional perspective, I would say uh, Russia must lose this war politically, um, militarily, and economically. 
as uh, long as the regime doesn't change, we need to focus on isolation and deterrence, and we must focus on the victory of Ukraine. And here, delivery of weapons are decisive. Poland and other Central and Eastern European states have done a lot in that respect to support Ukraine. We have given up some of our own reserves, stockpiles. We have uh, weakened our own defense capability to help Ukraine because their war is of exp existential importance for us. And the question now is, where is Germany? From our perspective, the answer to this question is not something that makes us absolutely happy. Germany could do so much more especially when it comes to delivering heavy weapon systems. 14 uh, howitzers, 14 leopards that haven't even arrived. That is not enough. Germany supplies a lot of uh, capabilities for air, de air defense equipment and logistics, but Ukraine needs much more. And Germany, as uh, the largest country in Europe, and the European Union could do much more. The next question from my perspective would be, what is the scenario that Germany has in mind when it comes to this war? Is it really the scenario described by Ms. Baerbock? That is to say, a complete victory of Ukraine, or is it rather a scenario that Germany wants to see this conflict, this war frozen? This, unfortunately, would lead to a continuation uh, of uh, the conflict and another flare-up of the war. And the question uh, would be, has anything changed here in Germany? From our regional perspective, my Polish perspective, I would say Ukraine in the middle long term must become part of the West uh, EU and NATO membership of Ukraine is decisive. Otherwise, we are not going to have peace in Eastern Europe and beyond because Russian attempts to recreate a new imperial Russia will not stop unless Ukraine becomes a member of the European Union and NATO. And so we in Poland, we wonder, How about Germany? Do they see the same strategy? My answer to that question would be no, Germany hasn't got the same strategy. We think that if Ukraine doesn't become part of the West in the years to come and remains in that buffer zone, then that will mean a continuing war in Europe, more wars and a war that goes beyond Ukraine. The third aspect, security policy, as I said before, for Poland, for the Baltic states, this war is of essential importance. It's really a turning point. We have understood we could be next. And that is why Poland and other states of the region have invested a lot into defense capability. We invested quickly. And here the question again is, how about Germany? Does Germany have the same opinion about the security policy? And does Germany think the same? When we look at the reform of uh, the German armed forces, after one year of a war in Europe, not much has happened. We have the special fund, but not much money from that special fund was spent. There were not there are not many uh, modernization projects start started in Germany, and the two percent defense budget has not been reached. The most important question for me is how about the German strategic culture? From what I hear from German politicians, I hear, hear a lot about German angst, angst, fear of a war, fear of an escalation. I don't hear much about strategic thinking. So I follow German politics, and I can say the Germans are much more advanced compared to the German mainstream, the overall German government.
But generally, I would say that Central and Eastern Europe, once again, is not being heard in Berlin, unfortunately. These were critical words. Jürgen, can you now respond to that? Because you'll get worse statements. Well, you are the foreign policy uh, spokesperson of the Green Party. That is why you have to explain German foreign uh, policy. And you're the punching ball for our, our panelists today. So after the friendly fire from Warsaw, let's get some more friendly fire from Washington Daily, and then you can respond and explain German foreign politics. And having said this, I'm going to move to the second question. And again, I'm going to ask our audience first. We will look at Washington, D.C. now. And one question that uh, we are all faced with in the context of the war is the United States have saved the statehood of Ukraine. They are still the most important uh, power for security in Germany. But uh, the United States would pass on uh, pass on to Germany to become the next lead nation. The question just is, is Germany able to be the lead nation to provide uh, stability in uh, Eastern Europe. If you think that is the case, show us your green card. If you think we are far from being capable, then show us the red card. And I see one green card in a sea, in an ocean of red cards. Sophia Besch. Maybe you comment on that question right now. Sophia Besch works at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. There, she always explains German foreign policy. And of course, she's very close to us because she's part of our uh, security uh, policy working group. Sophia, how about Germany? Is Germany able and capable? of being the lead nation for stability in Central and Eastern Europe. What is your position? Well, I don't have to say much. Uh, we've seen what our audience thinks, but let me talk about the uh, nuances. That is a question that I get very often in Washington. The uh, leadership role and the re leadership uh, desire uh, to here in, in, in Germany. Uh, the German word lead nation is Führungsmacht, and Führung is, of course, a word that is somehow tainted in Germany. Of course, we have the German claim that we always want to act together in an alliance. And of course, uh, there is, uh, of course, a contradiction to being the lead nation. And that has something to do with our uh, past, with our history, and we want to be part of an alliance. But uh, the chancellor also has said Germany wants to take leading responsibility. In that first Zeitenwende speech, it wasn't written on, on black and white, but it has something to do with us being the largest economic power in the center of uh, Europe. And therefore, we have to have a defense budget substantial enough for us to take the leads. And as far as Washington's and the American perspective is concerned, they do understand that the definition of leadership in Germany is different from the definition of leadership in the United States. Our hope to act in unity, uh, there they hope we will do it constructively instead of restrictively. Acting in unity can mean many things. It can mean I sit back and wait until the others are st start acting. But it can always mean that we bring people together, not leading together, but bringing people people together to form a proactive alliance. And here I think it is very important for us as Germans not only to look at Washington, but look at Europe as well. And maybe during that panel, we are going to talk about uh, the European capability to act more. And following up on Annalena Baerbock's speech, I think it's a lot about 
trust and confidence. And trust is also material trust, and it builds on investments also in the military and security policy capacities of Germany within NATO so that Germany is eventually able to fulfill its pledges and only then will be able to fulfill this leadership claim. Um, or this leadership role. And this is also the expectation in Washington that we do these investments. Um, and Joe Biden is quite a strong transatlanticist. And he, of course, considers the United States as a leading uh, power also in this uh, um, war. But also in Washington, people know that this might be the last transatlantic president. And it's not only about the U.S. orienting itself to the uh, Pacific. Um, it's also about a change in the politics in general in Washington. So this is also why Washington wants to see a Europe that is aware of its role and that we are able to act uh, together um, in the future in Europe. So thank you very much. Now I would like to leave the transatlantic uh, region and look towards Asia, Asia because um, as it's often being said, when you have an exchange on large geopolitical questions, then um, we have to say that Asia is important with the two emerging powers, uh, India and China. We talk a lot about China, but not that much about India, in fact. And at the same time, we very often read that in this new complex, India might become the key ally of the West. And this is why I would like to ask you, First of all, this is a, my question. Do you have the impression that the German foreign policy has understood the, the potential of India as a key ally in the 21st century? So Annalena Baerbock went to India recently, and Agena Mohan will also talk more about um, India. But do you have the impression that we sufficiently consider India an important ally if you say yes, green card, if you say no, red card. And I can see more red cards than green. Some people hold up both, so maybe it's a mixture of both. So the trend clearly is red. So Karima Muham, what's your impression as an observer also of German foreign policy, but also of the Indian policy. Garima Mohan is a scientific contributor of the German Marshall Fund. And I think uh, you went to Delhi with Annalena Baerbock recently. So how is our position towards India? Good afternoon. And I really did not think it would fall on me to inject a dose of optimism in this panel. But, but I'm here to do that. And um, let me give you a perspective from the Indo-Pacific. It's been extremely interesting listening to all of you in the first panel and the second panel, uh, really listening to European debates. I, I would wonder how many of you knew when the German government released the Indo-Pacific light linean a couple years ago. I don't think a lot of people stood up and took note. But since the war in Ukraine, I feel the distance between Europe and Indo-Pacific has reduced. And I don't mean, of course, geographically, uh, the distance is not reduced. But in terms of what Minister Baerbach was mentioning earlier, contested borders, aggressive countries, conventional war, all of these were challenges we were facing in the Indo-Pacific. And Europe, when, when uh, we looked at the sort of relationship between Asia and Europe, Europe seemed to be living in a post-modern, post-conflict world. Uh, perhaps that was not true. Uh, we were choosing 
interesting to look at it that way. Uh, but certainly the war in uh, Ukraine and, and Russia's aggression has opened new channels of communication, both for Asia to understand Europe and Europe to understand Asia. Uh, for me, where I think Germany has done a good job, and I would definitely give props to the Green Party there, not just because I'm here, um, but also because uh, of the role your minister had plays had played in understanding how the Russia challenge and lessons from Russia can be applied to China. Uh, the debates that we've seen emerge in Berlin uh, on China in particular have been slow, they've been late. Um, other European capitals have been far quicker to understand the complexity of the China challenge, but everything we're hearing since then has been absolutely on point. Um, and this understanding that the region, uh, what's happening in the Indo-Pacific, will have a clear impact on security and prosperity in Europe. Let's look at the role China is playing in this war. Uh, let's look at how the China-Russia relationship is shaping up. Let's look at how Russian disinformation is making it difficult for Europeans to build coalitions in Asia. Uh, this is not just you know, the case of India, which has been difficult particularly on this question, and, and the minister mentioned Indian dependencies for military technology on Russia, the India-China border question, but simply that Europe had abandoned um, Asia and looking at Asia for a long time, and that vacuum, frankly, was filled in by Russia. The disinformation game is strong. Uh, people in, in, in the region don't really know what NATO does, don't really know what European politics are, and Russia fills in its, frankly, disinformation in the region. But also in terms of building military partnerships, building infrastructure, building, uh, being there for these countries where Europe had abandoned, I think this is really a time for Europe to wake up and reckon with the Indo-Pacific theater, and I'm happy to see the right signs emerging. Uh, Minister Baerbock has visited the region a couple of times. Uh, she was in India, we hosted her in December as well, and I think uh, there were some really good conversations about sanctions, targeted sanctions, how to make coalitions, what countries can say publicly, what they cannot. Um, so I think these are good signs. Um, I think the Chancellor Scholz will also go to India later this year. So this is a good beginning, but as you mentioned, often the debates in Berlin is only about China. Every other country is secondary. We talk about diversifying away from China, but what does that mean? Do we have the capability to understand the rest of the region? That's a little bit of a question mark. Um, and I hope there are more experts coming up in Berlin who understand contemporary politics, not just of India, but also other countries in the region. Vielen Dank, Karima Mohan. Ich schau mal kurz uh, dich an, Corinna, weil die Frage... Thank you very much, Karima Mohan. I'm looking to you now because we also ask the questions online, the questions that we've asked here. You can just give me a sign. Have we received sufficient answers? Okay, we'll wait out for a little while. Uh, so for those who have joined an online hashtag, you can use it or go to uh, on Twitter, use the uh, foreign policy uh, department. And when we've reached a uh, critical mass, Corinna can give us some feedback from the online audience. So now, Jürgen Trottin, foreign policy spokesperson of the Greens, you have given some feedback, friendly fire from different regions. One topic that has popped up in all three areas is that things are changing in Germany when it comes to Eastern European policy, transatlantic context, or towards um, uh, Asia, but very slowly. And this has already been mentioned this morning. So why is this change, even though we talk about the Zeitenwende, and we feel this sense of urgency, why does it take so long? Or do you at all share this view that everything takes a lot of time in Germany until the geopolitical coordinates are readjusted? Jung Trittin. Well, I think this is part of the democratic stability in this country that the basic law is resistant to sudden change, so changes need to come about slowly, but then they are more sustainable. This is one of the region, reasons why 
uh, despite the developments that we see throughout the world, um, and who would have thought that 70 years ago, even though in those countries who have liberated us, would now consider Germany as a main place of democratic stability. So I wouldn't see this as a reproach, basically. But I would also like to ask you to consider what has changed when it comes to the foreign policy of the federal government. So very often people try to juxtapose the foreign minister and the chancellor these days. But when I look at the German government's foreign policy, I have to say the following. So up until a few years, uh, Asia policy was a China policy. And the Federal uh, Industry Association basically had the main say. So we did not uh, take into account um, other European partners and their interests. And the rest of Asia was not really of any interest. So when I look at the foreign activities of the chancellor in the past and um, the other politicians then, uh, it was predominantly um, an economic or economic trips. And they I mean, at, in Singapore or at the G, G20 in Indonesia, it was a complete contrast to the old tradition uh, of Germany's East Asia policy, which was predominantly a China policy. And this is something to do with the German Zeitenwender, with the insight that it is, on the one hand, right that uh, economic interconnections can reduce the likelihood of conflict, but a one-sided dependency is something that might encourage others to exacerbate conflicts. And in this spirit, I would say that we have found a starting point, and this is also being enhanced through governmental consultations with India and other countries, that leads to a visible change of the German East Asia policy. And part of it is that this foreign minister is working on a new China strategy. And publicly, it is being perceived that one are in favor of interests and the other in favor of values. That's rubbish. It's about a realistic China-focused policy. And a realistic China policy has to take into account the risk for our interests that result from the changing authoritarian character of China if it wants to be a good interest-based foreign policy. So you, we cannot simply say we are not interested in the ne in neglecting the international sea court and the obligations in connection with Hong Kong and we continue with our China policy. So this is basically the key why we have to work on the new China strategy. And this is also the reason why we are having discussions. Um, with regard to a new national security strategy. I think Annalena has described it very nicely. And I would also s defend the multidimensionality of it. Um, it's not the case that in Germany we don't know that for a long time a lot of money has been spent for nothing. I mean, we cannot put it differently. I always said with a defense budget, which is almost as big as Russia's, and Russia has waged several wars with, with it, and we cannot even uh, provide uh, good underwear to our troops that are in um, the Baltic states at the moment uh, for NATO. Um, so now we have 100 billion additional debts for this special fund in order to, uh, to mitigate this situation. But we also realize that uh, in this dispute with Russia, and I explicitly would like to say dispute with Russia, has several dimensions. No, NATO is not in a military dispute with Russia, but we are in an economic dispute with Russia. So we simply have to say this. I mean, we're also in a propaganda war with Russia and a systemic dispute with Russia. But in this dispute, it would be absolutely wrong, as it is being said in some parts of the government, in contrast to the coalition agreement, that the additional funds that we have to spend in for our integrated security, I mean, it would be wrong to no longer invest in a 
additional effort in the field of democracy, diplomacy, um, and um, economic cooperation and humanitarian assistance, etc. So Mr. Rasmussen has laid out a model for a security guarantee for Ukraine. And this model is based on uh, allowing Ukraine or putting Ukraine in a situation where it has a capable defense industry at the level of Israel in terms of the international level. So to cut the spending is not in line with our discussion of what we need. So the question, what will the Germans deliver, is an unanswered question. It's an open debate in the government whether we will eventually manage to come up to our own demands, which is based on a security strategy which takes into account the safety of life, of freedom, of our livelihood in a concept and which would is laying out a concept of resilience, of um, defense capabilities, and whether this can become part of our budget. This will be the interesting debate this year, and some, of course, will ask how quickly can we do it, and it all comes down to the funding. And one other um, aspect, especially when we have discussions under this headline here. Maybe we should also see what the future will have in store. I think there's one thing where Russia has already lost. The war in Ukraine is going to massively and sustainably weaken Russia geostrategically. The longer the war, the longer the, the, the more there is a risk for Russia to get dependent on China. And here I'd be a bit more cautious when answering the question about leadership. Uh, I mean, I was the Minister of the Environment in the European Council for a long t time. Uh, and uh, there was always a saying, well, the big countries shouldn't dominate uh, the smaller countries. But as soon as Germany and uh, France had reached an agreement, they said, oh, well, you didn't listen to the smaller countries. So we should not only uh, look at that. Uh, may we see a transatlantic honeymoon with the Biden uh, administration, but there might, might be a return of Trumpism. And then it will be, task, will be the task for Europe to develop its own geostrategy, acting solely on the basis of its own responsibility. And I think here Germany cannot do it alone. It needs partners uh, in Europe, important partners. And that is why becoming a leader for me always means being a leader in the framework of the European Union. If you want to respond, uh, give us a show of hands. If there's nothing coming from you over there, let me return to a topic mentioned by Annalena a lot, the question of partnerships. Germany, last but not least, we must rely on partners to develop its model of a successful trade nation. And that brings me again to the question of uh, India as a potential key ally. Because one thing we've learned and seen in the course of this 23rd foreign policy conference we have our comfort zone, NATO, EU, and we might also include three East Asian democracies. But outside that comfort zone, most countries have an ambivalent attitude vis-a-vis -vis Germany and the West, um, not completely antagonistic, but more neutral. When we need partners, key allies in the global south, partners such as India, Dirima, may I ask you, what should Germany do? How could Germany approach a country as India to get them interested in uh, having a more comprehensive partnership? Mm, a part of your question was already answered by what uh, Mr. Titten said, um, that Asia policy for so long was China policy. Uh, it's simply not a question of how can we work with 
partners like India, it is a question of why did we ignore partners like India for so long? Uh, France did not do that. Uh, the EU and Brussels woke up. I mean, UK has uh, had a pretty tumultuous relationship with India, but uh, they understood. Um, and in the last five years, we've actually seen India sign extremely interesting green strategic partnership with the Netherlands, a blue strategic partnership based on water um, with, with Denmark, a strategic partnership with Finland, Nordic summit. I mean, it feels to me that slowly every European country is seeing the value and benefits of working with India. Um, Germany has still been reluctant and slow. And let me say that the outreach has been uh, from both sides. Uh, so it's not just Europe interested in India. India's diplomatic investments in the West have increased tremendously. Now, I would like to talk about this because often in uh, German media, European media, we hear a lot of India's relationship with Russia. But let me give you a snapshot of what India does with the West now. Of course, uh, I'm sure everybody has heard of the Quad, but Indian students want to go to Western universities and study abroad in the West. In fact, we had more students in Ukraine than we had in Russia when the war broke out. Um, Indian trade, India has started negotiating free trade agreements and a majority of them are with countries of the West. Uh, Indian companies want to work with markets and economies of the West. In terms of technology, Europe is India's primary partner. In terms of diversifying its weapons platforms, military equipment, technology, India is looking towards the West. So it has been a concerted effort to engage Europe, to engage with, uh, with the United States um, and other partners. Of course, with Europe, there's always been a baggage uh, which has been um, exploited by countries like Russia, which can spin anti-imperialist narratives and, and bring them in this partnership as well. But um, India has been trying a lot to reach out to partners here. It has understood the future um, arc of Indian foreign policy is bending towards the West. It's actually not towards the East. So time the time is ripe. Why are we not taking over this opportunity? And I'm very glad when Minister Baerbock came to Delhi, because then the discussion was more nuanced. It was much more, it was not so much about why did you abstain from a UN vote, but also what role can India play in its upcoming G20 presidency? By the way, it also has the presidency of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization this year. What can India do to bridge the gap between the West and the Global South? The Indian foreign minister likes to say that India is a Western Southern country. Now this is incredible for, for a country whose identity has been in the non-aligned movement, whose identity has been in the non-West for so long to say that we want to play a leadership role in bridging the gap between the West and the Global South. And by the way, India did just that at the G20 summit in Bali, which had a very, very strong final statement on Ukraine. Um, so I think it, there is an opportunity to not simply write off New Delhi, but actually see where Europe can work with it, particularly in these important platforms like G20 and making sure that um, the response to Ukraine is mirrored and understood in other Global South countries, which, by the way, have very different understandings of the conflict. Vielen Dank, Karima Mohan. Um, ich glaube, die Thank you very much. I think the partnership with uh, India that we can and should expand still means harbors a dilemma for the green foreign policy. And here I would just uh, mention the buzzword value-based foreign policy. Why am I saying it's a di dilemma? I think cold geopolitical uh, reason tells us India would be a good partner. The value-based heart says that India at the moment uh, is governed by a nationalist government. Uh, to put it even harsher, uh, we could say it's a kind of neo-fascist government that is in power in India. And this is um, some kind of uh, tension that we also have to a lesser extent with Poland. Uh, Justina, we should have a stronger partnership with Poland. Uh, excuse me for being so provocative. 
from the point of view of a green value-based foreign policy, we have our limits. But as soon as we leave uh, security policy and as soon as we see what the Polish government says about LGBTIQ rights that are important to us as Greens. So that was my provocation to all of you. Justina, may I first of all ask you, How can we deepen a German-Polish partnership at a time where we have our common threats for Poland, the threat is even higher? And what do we do about the fact that uh, in Poland, outside security policy, there are a number of uh, topics where a German government that wants to have a feminist and uh, a feminist foreign policy finds it somehow difficult? Thank you for this question. I am dealing predominantly with security policy, and so I'd better focus on that area. And first of all, let me explain how we could get a partnership in the security policy arena. A prerequisite for a close, true partnership in security policy It would be necessary for Germany to implement its Titan vendor in the security policy field. When it comes to you, Russia and the Ukraine, the implementation of a modernization and reform of the federal armed forces, a German commitment, stronger commitment in NATO. Here, Germany should show that Germany takes the military security of Europe seriously. I do agree with you that our confrontation with Russia has also different dimensions. And here, Germany's contribution is uh, important as well. But from our perspective, this hard military security at the moment is priority number one. And here, we have to do more, both in the region and in Germany. And I think if Germany proves to be a reliable partner in that respect in the years to come. And many uh, many people have high hopes, uh, given that Germany has Mr. Pistorius as the new Minister of Defense. Uh, we hope that he is going to tackle the modernization topic and uh, the topic of uh, NATO's eastern flank. Here, I think we would have many more opportunities to strengthen German-Polish cooperation in the military field. When it comes to the military presence in Lithuania and the Baltic states, more common exercises, more cooperation when it comes to air defense. And I think this uh, happens already with the German Patriot batteries in the south of Poland. Of course, a decisive element will be the outcome of the Polish elections. I think the Polish elite is uh, skeptical when it comes to Germany and the development of the Zeitenwender. And after the elections, we'll have to see which party is going to win and form a government. I think there will be a cooperation, a, a, an attitude for more cooperation with Germany in the field of security policy. Jürgen. Now, I'd like you to respond to these issues. We always proclaim our value-based foreign policy. And in that concrete respect, uh, do we have to strengthen our German-Polish relationship. So is it a stumbling block that Poland has a government that does not agree with us in on all the principles that we consider important? Or would you say, uh, like Agnieszka, within security policy, we have enough room for cooperation, and there will be a time for later to solve uh, all our other common sort of problems. So what is your dilemma between value-based foreign policy and uh, the current security policy aspect? Well, I personally, I 
prefer the term value-based real politic. Real politics, I know why I prefer this term. And I know uh, you were not saying that the Polish government is fascistoid. It's an, an, an attitude I would not uh, support. It's a nationalist, a right-wing populist government that has an extreme difficulty with the division of powers. But as far as uh, fascist insinuations are concerned, I wouldn't use that term. Of course, we have to deal with what we have. And uh, sometimes we should have this in mind when we have a discussion about that. The Polish Peace Party is conducting an election campaign. And of course, uh, uh, they do it for their own voters, for their own electorate. And uh, they always are successful when you when they accuse Germany. We have to acknowledge that they do it for their internal purposes. We have to be confident enough uh, just to turn a blind eye of that instead of exaggerating all these things. Then as Germany sometimes We must say we spend a lot of mo money for little achievements. So we have a very uh, unclear procurement system. A lot of our military material is not ready to fight. We have uh, reported 290 Leopard tanks for collective uh, alliance defense, also for the Polish territory. And really, we only have a 100 of these tanks that uh, are workable. So this is our legacy. This is what we have to deal with. On the other hand, we also have to have in mind that Germany next to the United States and the UK is one of the three big suppliers of weapons for Ukraine. Germany has worked within the framework of the European Peace Facility and regularly one-fourth of the national funds of our national funds were provided. And in spite of the equipment deficit that we have, in spite of the fact that our Puma tanks are very difficult to operate, but still uh, in Lithuania we have taken good action. I think more is possible, more is necessary. But sometimes they paint a dark picture that Germany is doing nothing and all the rest are doing a lot. This is something that I wouldn't agree to because for common European security, it makes a difference whether Estonia spends 3% of its GDP or Germany spends 2 depends. It's a major difference for the overall security of Europe. Last remark of mine, talking about values. When we talk about values, I think we should be honest. Let's take the example of South America where the chancellor just was. There's a lot of uh, uh, difficulty we have with the attitudes. Uh, 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 the attitude of the Brazilian government and others, and also our relationship to India. We do not have a world that consists solely of East and West. There are four different uh, latitudes, and uh, each of our regions has a history and a truth of its own. And it is not true that uh, we always had a value-based uh, policy in the West and in the United States. We see it in Latin America. And there is no major reason why a, uh, a dem democracy cannot be colonial. And I think we have to have this in mind. And this is one of the difficulties. If we say we want countries such as Brazil and India takes a different decision. I mean, India has a problem. It's not. A dictatorship. It's a country that we can have as a partner in our alliance. But first and foremost, we must be honest enough to say that for a long time we have been using double standards. 
I am not saying this because I want to prevent a new policy to be developed, but we have to have this legacy in mind when we enter into partnership with these countries, because in their collective memory, this reality exists. We had double standards for a long time, but this means that you imply or insinuate that we have improved and that we now have at least the beginnings of a value-based foreign policy. Well, I'm rather someone who is full of optimism. I think we can improve, and this government has embarked on this path, but I uh, cannot promise you anything. Well, I would like to ask this question to the audience, because I think it's also one of our Twitter questions. So do you think that Germany has a value-based foreign policy? If yes, show us the green card. If no, show us the red card. And I'm looking forward to your answer. It is quite a mixed picture, I have to say. Here we have more green cards. Well, I think green is, uh, we have more green cards. So we do see signs of a value-based foreign policy. Now I'm looking at Corinna. Is there interesting feedback from the internet uh, that you would like to share with us? Unfortunately, she's not using a microphone. I cannot hear it. Should we give you a microphone or is it too little? Too little, okay. So this morning it was uh, better maybe due to the moderator, the facilitator, which was better. So Sophia, you wanted to say something. Well, in terms of values and interests, much has been said already. I think I'm in line with the foreign minister here that we should not um, raise this question as some kind of juxtaposing um, aspect, but it's both part of our foreign policy. Uh, but I would like to say a few words on procurement because this topic was brought up. And I fully agree to Mr. Trittin. I think that the reforms are absolutely necessary. And I see that uh, here there are people in the audience uh, who are from the Defense Committee. I'm looking. I'm really happy about the, the pressure that is um, exerted in the Defence Committee. We really need to tackle this huge task, which should not be taken lightly if we want to implement this Titan and also in the military realm. I do think that the European dimension also has to be taken into account here because we are faced with the risk that um, at the moment we see defense spending, like shopping bonanza, all the member states have uh, ramped up their defense budgets, which is right, this is good. But the problem is that we are running the risk that we might end up in five years from now where we were before the war started, which is a non-interoperable uh, European uh, defense capability. Everyone is spending money on different systems. We are spending uh, um, twice as much as we would have to if we would cooperate here. And in the long term, we are faced with the risk of spending too much money now and that we might see a crowding out effect, which means that the smaller States and the Eastern European front states that are mostly affected by that might not get their share in this expenditure. So when it uh, comes to European procurement, then, of course, I mean, there have been suggestions from the Commission and the European Parliament on how to approach the funding or creation of funding incentives and a better coordination at the European level. And last aspect, also Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia need to be taken into account. So when we have a joint European procurement, then we also have to think about interoperability when it comes to our troops and the defense um, industry in those countries before they become a member. Because what we do now, what we decide upon now is what we will use in 10 to 15 years from now, that much about procurement. Christina, I Justina, I saw that you would like to react to it, but very be very brief, please, because I also would like to uh, include the audience. Well, thank you. I just wanted to say a few words about the criticism from Poland towards Germany, because very often I hear that this is an element of the Polish electoral campaign. This is peace propaganda, and sometimes I'm also called a propagandist, usually on Twitter. So if you assess the criticism in that way, 
if you have such a view on that criticism, the strategic situation and how this region looks at Germany, then of course you have a distorted view on the perception of Germany and Europe in that region when it comes to this war. And I would like to uh, warn people to simply denounce it as peace propaganda. Large parts of the political landscape in Poland consider the German policy in the same way. And this is also a view that is widely spread in the Baltic states and uh, northern states. And um, um, I think we sometimes tend to speak alongside each other. Sometimes Germany tries to dodge these strategic questions that I've raised. And then Germany prefers to talk about deficits in the Polish democracy and rule of law. And I think that this is unfair and this is not really up to the situation. When we have to talk about very important strategic and security policy related questions. Thank you very much, Justina. Well, we have uh, almost 15 minutes left. I already see a hand uh, going up here and here as well. So. Maybe, first of all, the gentleman over there, and then Michaela Schreier, and then we can go over here. And I would like to collect a few questions before we answer it. My name is Sama'i Salim. Two remarks. The U.S. has not been a global judge. It has been a global sheriff. Now my second remark. In Forum First, Robert Kagan, uh, issue, the first issue, 2022, he s says, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 41, the attack uh, of Japan on Pearl Harbor, then 9 11, and Ukraine are a consequence of hegemony. It is not what we say or hear every day. So what would you say in this regard? Thank you very much, Michaela Schreier, first row. Well, very brief question from my side. In terms of the coordination in the procurement within the EU, this is a question to Ms. Besch. So how would you assess the fact that Poland has now decided to give its leopard tanks to Ukraine and buy Abraham's tanks instead. Thank you very much. I see more hands uh, of people who have already asked a question. So this is why I would like to give you the floor and then you afterwards. So you have already posed a question. Thank you. My question refers to Mr. Trittin because I think he is knowledgeable in this uh, regard. And this is connected to uh, the ambassador's question. There have been many mistakes in the German foreign policy. And my question is whether there is the political will to form an enquete commission in order to uh, investigate the German-Russia policy because the fact that you should learn from your mistakes in order to avoid them in the future is not really sufficient from my point of view. So I would like to know if there is the lesson, if you've learned the lesson that those people who have uh, conducted this policy for many years um, have to be uh, um, made responsible for it and that we all learn from it. Last question now. Uh, to my great question, uh, my, my friend Garima Mohan, I was in Washington recently and I was told that under normal circumstances, India would be a very difficult partner because um, they have a double standard policy. They buy Russian gas at a low price and sell it to the Western states at a high price. There is a strong Hindu nationalism. The Hindu race is considered uh, more valuable than other races, which is very uh, problematic for uh, people in Germany. Um, but still, in Washington, people say, with regard to a real politic, uh, realistic policy, India 
could be a strategic counterbalance towards China. Should we Germans or Europeans see it the same way that India is a difficult partner in terms of domestic policy, where the press is being suppressed, um, and we also hear it from from our correspondents, where there is um, there are huge difficulties for minorities and a difficult political system. But should we still say, just to create a counterbalance to China, that we neglect all these aspects and still consider India as a partner? This would be my question. Great. Now I would like to say that we start a final round. Karima, we start with you. Final statement, one minute. Um, I think that's a question that I've been getting for the entire time, the 10 years that I've been working um, on India, India and Europe, um, I do think the juxtaposition of should we work with India or should we completely let it go is a false binary. Um, any country in the Indo-Pacific you can pick up, you will not find a perfect democra democratic rec record. You will not find a perfect human rights record. And as we just had a discussion, you don't even have that here in Europe. Um, so I do think that you don't need to ignore what's going on in India to be, have a partnership. The EU and India just revived their human rights roundtable. If you, um, as I said, India is also doing an outreach to the West. This is an opportunity to engage and ask difficult questions. Uh, the United States does it, but as you mentioned, the China challenge is a bigger challenge for the US. Uh, Europe is in a different position, and it should and will take a different approach. I do have strongly take issue with the juxtaposition of let's not work with India. Where was this when you were working with China? Everything was ignored and two wrongs don't make a right. Yes, we should learn from our mistakes of uh, what we did with China, what we did with Russia to an extent. But let's understand that it's not so black and white. These countries have a rich history, culture, struggles with democracy. We know it too. We're working for it as well. And I'm sure there are rights groups in India who would love to have support of governments. The Bell Foundation does great work on this as well. Uh, so I, that's the point I would like to end with, the black and white characterization. I, it bothers me. Thanks. Sophia Bech, es gab eine Frage zur europäischen Rüstungsindustrie. There was also a question in terms of the European defense um, industry, which you would like to answer, Sophia. Yes, I can fully understand why Poland has taken its decision the way it did. On the one hand, it was about the quick provision of equipment that was absolutely urgently needed. On the, the other hand, it was about the partnership and the security guarantees that they hoped for from the United States by buying this equipment. And on the other hand, it was about the European project of the next uh, tank generation after the Leopard. It was only pursued by France and Germany, and Poland did not really join in. So this means from a Polish perspective, it's absolutely logic to not put all eggs in the European basket. There are different reasons why countries do not procure together. On the one hand, it's the financial and the bureaucratic effort they would have to make. And of course, the EU could make a start here. They could try to streamline it, try to reduce bureaucracy um, to make it easier for countries to procure together. But there are also other reasons why some countries do not want to do it. One reason is that you would like to get security guarantees, for example, from the US. Um, and you might also prefer to buy off-the-shelf high-tech instead of developing it your own. And of course, this can only be tackled with political will. This can only be done at the membership level. The EU cannot really try to uh, influence the national rationale. But I hope that with the different insights um, about which we have heard a lot throughout the day, that it's not only about the security in Ukraine, but in Europe as a whole, we will see in the long run that there will be a political will and a change in the political will in the national states and that everyone realizes that we have to jointly invest in our uh, common uh, defense. Uh, Justina, in terms of procurement, yes, Poland gave 300 old post-Soviet tanks to Ukraine and now 100 refurbished post-Soviet tanks will be supplied and we also 
start with the leopard tank deliveries. Norway recently announced that they would order uh, 54 Leopard A2 tanks in Germany, and the delivery period is 2026 to 2031. What does this mean for Poland? So the Polish decision was quite clear. So if the Ukraine loses and we are next, then, of course, we need a quick supply of tanks. So this is why Poland did not only order in the U.S., the 200 Abram tanks, but also in South Korea because they can deliver quickly and the deliveries will come now. And this is basically the experience with the defense industry in Europe and in Germany. Germany cannot deliver tanks quickly or cannot produce tanks quickly. And this is an area where Germany needs to improve. And you also need to give incentives to the defense industry. Uh, you need other legal provisions so that um, we can become better in this area. We can produce more quickly in this area because the need is huge. It's not only the German armed forces. It's the Ukraine that needs to be supplied with. It's the eastern flank. It's all of Europe. Um, that needs to ramp up its uh, defense capabilities. And this is another very important area, especially problematic um, for uh, the Greens, but we have to do much more than uh, before. Uh, point. Thank you very much. Uh, there was one question about uh, Ostpolitik, the policy vis-a-vis -vis Eastern Europe that there were so many assumptions that never came true. And the question, are you going to uh, so take stock of uh, our old ideas of Ostpolitik, or is it all going to be pushed under the carpet? As a member of uh, the party that during the 16 years of Grand Coalition and uh, Black and Yellow Coalition, we have been saying time and again, uh, Putin is not an ally, is a danger, is going to be re repressive both inside and outside his own country. And so we have finally brought about change. Uh, do Are we going to have an inquiry committee with the consent of those who will be responsible for the old policy. But my recommendation would be to, first of all, look at the new paper of the Social Democratic Party regarding uh, foreign policy and security policy. They are very self-critical, uh, and I really see that there are practical changes that have already taken place. So instead of a historical stock taking, uh, I think we should be practical and look at uh, the new positions. Maybe such an acquiring committee will come in the next, uh, next over next term, but we never know. As far as defense is concerned, of course, we need to develop our own uh, defense capabilities. Uh, but of course, uh, we need more demand. And that was the practical reason why Poland looked at the United States and Korea. And uh, it was also the uh, practical reason why we bought the F-35 from the United States. But we have a much more far-reaching Descends. Many countries in uh, the European Union think that in our multipolar world, and that's an experience we've had over four years, in our multipolar world, we cannot just rely on an absolutely firm alliance with the United States. Uh, investment always costs money and a lot of resources. But it is the reason why we have to invest into our own European sovereignty. And of course, that leads to some unpleasant questions like, what will happen to nuclear deterrence? But I think, or I know, that European sovereignty and strengthening European sovereignty is 
the strategic bone of contention that we have also with Poland, uh, uh, not just re with the Peace Party, but everywhere. There we have a French-German position, and we have another position in the countries of Central Europe. Overcoming this uh, dissent is very important for us to become capable of taking joint action in the whole of the European Union. Thank you very much. I think that was a very interesting Tour d'horizon. We looked at the, uh, the green, the German green international security policy. My summary is we are on a good track. We could be faster. But I also learned that the Zeitin vendor has uh, set things in motion. And we all have learned. Would be better if we were all a bit faster. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That was the 23rd Foreign Policy uh, Conference of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Before I say goodbye, I would like to thank our panelists, Gerima Mohan, Sofia Besch, Justina Godkowska, and Jürgen Tretin. A few men, more names to mention before you applaud. I also would like to say thanks to Melina Greenwald, my colleague. She comes from the Foreign and Security Policy Disc. She was my co-organizer for this conference. I also would like to thank Corinna Fischer from the Global Diplomacy Lab. She was very helpful in organizing this conference. I also would like to thank our event office. Uh, thanks to all our interpreters. Probably was a very complicated debate we had. They had to follow uh, all of that and uh, bring it across to another language. Thanks to all my colleagues from the Bell Foundation for having supported me. And I would like to mention some very special colleagues, my colleagues in Ukraine. At the moment, their conditions are so difficult. Uh, they have uh, bomb raids, they have power outages, but they continue to work for the Bell Foundation in the Ukraine. I do not know whether you uh, follow us uh, online, but I'm proud of you, and now I think it's time for applause. See you all in one year from now. That was the 23rd Foreign Policy Conference of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Goodbye.